Welcome to Dev Relevant. I'm your host, Danny Mulvihill. In this show, we explore tools and topics in the tech scene through the lens of developers, engineers, and DevRels. All right, welcome to this episode of the Dev Relevant Podcast. Today, my guest is Nick Frostbutter. So he does <laughs> developer relations at Solana Foundation. He's also the co-host of the Sulfate Podcast and also recently started the Solana Dev List, if you have maybe heard about that, if you're in the Solana ecosystem. So Nick, welcome. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks, Danny, for having me. I'm super excited to, to chat today. For sure. So I kind of wanted to just jump right in and ask you, what is it about Solana that devs should be paying attention to if maybe they're mm. kind of on the outskirts and have been working in other uh, blockchains and networks? Why should they give Solana a second look and consider jumping in and building something here? Yeah, sure. I think the biggest one is like, I mean, it's it's been the talk of the town. The, the common selling point is like fast and cheap is kind of the mantra of Solana. Mm -hmm. And especially when you compare to uh, Ethereum based blockchains and EVM chain and like layer twos and roll ups and all that kind of stuff, you have this inherent problem with other blockchains that have this type of layer two scaling solution where not only are you fracturing liquidity of anyone who's trying to use the chain, you now have to go to different layer twos to do, you know, a specific thing, whatever that layer two is dedicated for gaming, ZK, whatever mm -hmm. that fractures liquidity, which makes it more difficult for users to use. And that's already a problem in its own. But I think personally, the biggest thing is the user experience issue that that runs into when you have like if we, if you work in blockchain, you already know it's inherently difficult to try to get people to build on blockchain or to use blockchain. You know, the mm -hmm. media does a terrible job generally, big media at least, does a terrible job generally of covering the goods and bads of what blockchain is and what it can do. They only ever focus on the bad, like typical media things. Mm -hmm. But so if you've already, you get past that hurdle of trying to convince a user to use blockchain, they need a wallet you got to convince them to install a browser extension, install an app. You're just adding friction points, adding more and more friction points. And then you get to, you finally convince them to say, install MetaMask or Phantom to do, to be their EVM based wallet. Now they are like, okay, well there's six different layer twos or, you know, there's way more well, than six, yeah, a whole sure. bunch of layer twos. You need to convince them to switch between bridge across and do all of these things. You're just stacking so many friction points in front of users. Not, not even to mention that all of those are super slow. Like if you're going to try to bridge from one layer two to another or a layer two to EVM mainnet, the mm -hmm. bridging process is slow, but the user experience of just using Ethereum mainnet is also super slow. On Solana, the value prop is fast and cheap. One giant state machine, everyone's liquidity, it's all in one place, one global state, and it's all super fast, um, super fast and super cheap. A single transaction on Solana can get um, processed in about 400 milliseconds and then finalized in um, 13, 14 seconds. So it's super mm -hmm. fast and you get like effectively instant confirmation. And like with that, the user experience side of, you know, if you're building something in Web 2, you users are used to that Web 2 experience. They're used to it being really quick, really, really snappy. And you just can't have that with most blockchains. And Solana, you can have that. You can have that almost immediate feedback, sub one second feedback of your action is complete. And then you could do all sorts of like UI tricks, like optimistically, mm -hmm. you know, adjust your UI sort of stuff to make it even feel even snappier. But it, it's just like, that's, that's kind of the, the value prop of, of why Solana, it just kind of solves all of these problems, not even to mention like some of the other uh, interesting things that a lot of layer twos are trying to solve. Like a lot of that just exists on Solana at the base chain and as like a mm -hmm. smart contract too, which is also awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's interesting I like is how you, your initial or really your immediate response to that question is the user experience. So it's not even so oh, yeah. much about like uh, the developer experience of why somebody might want to work with it, but you know, you're going to have to build either way. And so you might as well think about, you know, what the outcome is going to be for the users that ultimately make your app matter or not. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I'm, I'm anyone who knows me, they know I'm a user experience maxi, like blockchain is very cool, but if you don't mm. have good user experience, no one's going to use it. So it doesn't matter. Um, so it's like having having good user experience is so important, not only at the base chain, but like the applications you're interacting with. And, you know, that's a whole separate thing. A lot of people in blockchain are super hardcore engineers and not the best UI um, 
front end developers. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a whole separate thing. But yeah, user experience for sure. And like, I mean, the developer experience on Solana is also really good. Uh, tons of tools, more and more in the works. You can choose a bunch of languages to build stuff. But the thing is, is like, if you're going from web two to blockchain, there's already inherently a learning curve. It's like choosing mm-hmm. a tech stack. You need to learn the tools, you need to learn the tech stack. And while Solidity is a much easier language to understand, because it's basically JavaScript, um, yeah, like it has, it looks it, a lot it, like it. <laughs> it's, it looks a lot like JavaScript. So like people are more comfortable when they're coming from web two, because there's a lot of JavaScript devs. So mm-hmm. it's like going through that, you have um, the learning curve is is way lower. It's like a familiar syntax. You, you can pick it up a lot quicker. But the detriment of Solidity is once you try to do more complicated things, it just falls apart. Like you have to do crazy gas optimizations. You have to really, really know what you're doing. Vice on the mm. flip side with Solana and typically Rust is, is the go-to language mm. for smart contracts, for programs. The learning curve is higher if you don't already know Rust, which most of the people um, don't. The learning curve yeah. is higher if you want to build these smart contracts. And like understanding the programming model, there's it's just different than other blockchains because Solana is just designed differently. It's not just a copy and paste of the Ethereum code with modifications. Mm-hmm. And because of that, the learning curve is steeper to start. So like developer experience kind of like there's a friction point there for sure. But you, once you understand what's going on after taking like a week or two, just to just, just wrap your head around it, you can build so many more things that are a faster, more flexible, more um, computational heavy, heavy, because you're using a, a, a real programming language of Rust. You're using a very <laughs> powerful programming language that is just like mm. so flexible that you can do almost anything with it. Yeah, I've only really heard good things about rust um maybe aside from the learning curve of picking it up but overall pretty much anybody who touches it and knows how to use it loves it um which is you know certainly a compelling point let's dig into that first few weeks of developer experience because i'm also quite passionate about this idea of um you know everybody in web3 is we go to all these web3 conferences like we just saw each other eth denver and everybody's like of it and you know and like living it and breathing it and what gets me excited is, you know, I've heard various people say, oh, there's roughly 30,000 blockchain developers and there's probably two to three million, you know, web application developers. And so the thing True that statement. gets me interested is like, how do we get those devs in here? And so let's talk about that first one to two weeks. If you could, let's say, give two or three tips to a web two dev who wants to give Rust a try and get into the Solana ecosystem, what are a few things that you might point them towards to help ease that onboarding as a developer? So, yeah, that's that's a really good question. I think there's a couple of things. Um, One, I love pointing this out, is you actually don't ever need to write a line of Rust code to build on Mm. Solana uh, or in the Solana ecosystem specifically. Solana is inherently composable, so you can use other people's smart contracts and programs just using JavaScript and a language you already know. Um, you basically, you know, use their SDK that gives you like the mm. objects and the, the structure of whatever information those those programs, those smart contracts are expecting. So you don't ever have to write Rust if you don't want to, which is awesome. But if you do get to the point of wanting to write custom on chain logic. Um, Rust is typically that language. And I think the the things that I would probably point people to is one, um, take like a take a single day and like we have a bunch of um, talks on the Solana Foundation uh, YouTube account and it, take a day or so and just like consume the content of what is the programming model on Solana? What does it look like? I There's four important terms that everyone needs to understand. It's um, transactions, instructions, accounts, and programs. And if you understand those four things, you're, you're off to the races. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, like I said, a whole bunch of videos on the foundation's YouTube channel, Solana foundation's YouTube channel. Um, so that's the first thing is, is get an understanding of, of how the tech works under the hood because it works so much different than other blockchains. And it, the way that it works is so similar to a typical web two development experience. Like you're effectively just making it, it's, it's effectively like making, um, like a REST API call. Like you're just making HTTP post and get requests 
and that's it. Mm -hmm. Like that's how you do most things on blockchain. And a lot of people just don't understand that because like we as blockchain dev devrel people, we don't do a great job of surfacing that information, but it's, <laughs> it's, you know, an RPC. That's just an HTTP endpoint. That's, that's all it is. Right. Um, or at least for the most part from like the DevX experience. Um, so understand the programming model, and then on for Solana specifically at solana.com slash developers, there's a whole bunch of like guides and, and courses and stuff that we link out to. A bunch of them are, are built from uh, a bunch of really amazing uh, people and, and companies in the ecosystem, both in blockchain and non-blockchain, um, trying to do like that education. But spend a week or two learning those and then the best way that people generally learn, especially adults, I, I've before <laughs> working at Solana Foundation, I did a whole bunch of uh, education stuff um, mm -hmm. for nuclear engineering. And one of the best ways that people learn is adults specifically is one of two things. One, it's a jobs to be done sort of framework of like, I have a task to build something as an engineer. Like I was told to build this thing with blockchain. A lot of engineers be like, tech is cool, but they don't really care the implementation. They're just going to go write some code. So they don't necessarily want to go through all this like background information to build a, build things. Mm -hmm. And that's just like human nature, totally understandable. Yeah. And then on the flip side is, or additionally to that is most adults learn best by like actually being motivated about what the thing they're trying to build is. So if you're passionate about learning Web3 and building in Web3, build something. That's like the best way to learn, especially mm -hmm. with code. Like most devs, like that's how our brain works. Build something super small, find some random I idea that you think is interesting and take a couple of days and uh, just like build it, build something super simple. And you learn so much by building something super simple and you retain that information way, way better. So those are, those are the big things that I would say. Yeah. So just to rehash that, um, I, I really like the idea of spending a day, you know, if you're really committed and you want to get in here to learn the programming model and maybe, you know, you can play with the order of these things. Um, because I completely agree with this concept of actually building something whenever I've, you know, like worked or tried to mentor or, or coach some younger engineer. I'm like, what is something interesting to you? Okay, go build that. And like, it, just do that first. And then you fill in so many little gaps that like a, a perfectly edited tutorial will, will bump over, you know, oh, yeah. like all the bugs have been removed and all the issues. Yeah. And then of course, you know, you inherently run into them when you're trying to do it. Um, but then this concept of uh, really understanding the programming model. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something that I haven't taken the time to do with Solana, which is why I'm still sort of on the outside looking in <laughs> and was excited to talk to you. Um, you said that it's important that a new dev understands transactions, instructions, accounts, and programs. Would yep. you mind just uh, digging into each one of those a little bit more at a high level? Yeah, sure. Sure. This is, uh, I think you actually, when we met up at ETH Denver, I was actually giving an in-person talk on this. Um, nice. But yeah, so these are these four uh, terms, these, these four key uh, definitions to understand it are just like, it's the fundamentals of how Solana works. So the first one is accounts. Everything on Solana is an account. Some people like to use an analogy of it's like files on a Linux file system. And that's because those docs were initially written by like, uh, embedded pro, uh, embedded engineers um uh -huh. so it's not the best analogy for most people but <laughs> everything on solana is an account so solana is a global state machine it's just the data is always available just like any sort of state machine that you've ever worked with as a developer and all of that state is stored in an account and effectively think of an account like a uh like a database entry you have a unique key. That's your, your primary key of that database record entry. You have a unique key called the address. And you can just always ask the blockchain, what's the data stored at this address? That's an account, effectively. You think of like mm -hmm. a, a, your wallet address. That's an account on Solana. It stores some amount of, of tokens in it, right? Um, and some data. The next one is programs. Programs are also accounts because everything on Solana is an account. And uh, programs, <laughs> smart contracts, as they're called on other blockchains, um, programs, they just basically have special data stored inside the account. And that data is the actual bytecode of the compiled, uh, your compiled logic of whatever you wrote or whatever someone else wrote and that's stored in an account. The Solana runtime knows how, knows, knows that those program accounts are 
or those specific accounts are programs, and then it'll process it as a program as bytecode and then execute the logic. And then the next one is transactions. If you're familiar with blockchain, you know, you do transactions, you sign a transaction with your wallet, you send it to and from, you know, gets gets transferred around the, the networks and consensus happens and does all of its magic. And like all of its all of its amazing feats of engineering, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, transactions on Solana are different than EVM chains. And the big difference is one, there's no base fee, there's a base fee, but the base fee does not adjust based off of network congestion like EVM mm -hmm. chains. Um, so like gas, you have to modify how much gas you're paying, you've set thresholds and stuff like that. Bad user experience. Um, on Solana, there's a base fee, and then you can add an, an additional like minor priority fee, but it's also still a fraction of a fraction of a penny in the end. And a transaction is, is think of it just like this is your request to the blockchain to do something. You're trying to uh, execute some logic on chain, and you're effectively you build the transaction on your client and then you send it using that, those RPCs, that HTTP um, post request. You're just sending a, you know, to a rest endpoint effectively. Here's my request. Give me a response. The blockchain does its thing in the background. You get a response. That's a transaction. Instructions are one of the um, internal pieces of a transaction. And it's specifically the actual uh, request the actual request of the blockchain to execute some logic. So if you think of blockchain like a REST API, you have a REST API endpoint. If you are making a request to the blockchain, you're sending a transaction. And within that HTTP request, you have your body, right? You're just sending mm -hmm. some data. Well, imagine if that body always was an array and you're always sending a list of actions that you want the uh, backend API to do. That's what instructions are. It's those individual items within the array. And the cool thing about Solana is that these instructions are, uh, one, they're atomic. So they get executed uh, serially. So if, mm -hmm. if one of them fails, so if index one fails, say you have three different instructions, if index one fails, the entire transaction fails, only mm -hmm. if every single um, instruction is successful, the entire transaction will be successful. Um, but it makes it so you can basically execute multiple programs, multiple smart contracts, all in the same transaction. So you can do 10 different mm. Um, program interactions in one transaction within within a Solana transaction. Um, so that's that's and probably have it be a, atomic. So and then have anything, it be atomic. Yeah, yeah. So like an example that I like to give that a lot of people understand because like people kind of understand tokens. Um, so the example I like to give for this is like say you had a transaction and you want to mint a token. You want to like create a token, like a brand new token. You want to mint those tokens so that way someone can own them. And then you want to transfer them to someone else. So if the instruction zero is create the token on chain with your metadata and all that kind of good stuff, instruction one, index one is uh, transfer the tokens. And then index two is... Um, create the tokens or sorry, mint the tokens. If you notice that those are actually out of order of how that logic would work. So the transaction mm -hmm. would fail because you are trying to transfer tokens that have not been created yet. So the transaction mm -hmm. fails. Vice, if you switch the order of these, then uh, everything uh, works correctly because that state exists on chain. And as those mm -hmm. state transitions occur on chain itself, the logic will pass, the transaction passes, and then you've you've done token things. Um, so that's, that's one example of how, how I like to explain it to people since people generally understand how tokens work, although I will give it a caveat of tokens work very differently on Solana than on, um, on Ethereum chains. Ooh, okay, so let's dig into that one in a second. I had one more just clarification question. So on Solana, everything's an account. Mm -hmm. Is the set of instructions an account? Or is because that's composed like within the transaction... The trans is the transaction an account like <laughs> touche touche um so no instructions and transactions are not accounts so let me rephrase everything that is stored on chain is an account mm. the okay, way that cool. you will interact with the chain is via transactions and instructions and those are just the http requests back and forth to interact with the chain and with the blockchain and then get a response back Awesome. Okay, so now you said, uh, or a second ago, you said tokens are different on Solana and Ethereum, for example. And we'll just kind of keep using these two um, options sure. to compare. So let's dig into that one, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So I'll just, just to, to, to frame it out, I guess, 
on Ethereum, in the way that you would create a token, say you want to create, you know, a USDC, for example, who, who doesn't love USDC? If you wanted to create <laughs> USDC government. on Ethereum, well, I, I mean, I, I think it depends on the government, but I think a lot of governments do actually like USDC. Um, stable coins are inherently interesting for digital uh, transfer of digital value. Um, but that's a whole separate conversation. Yeah, we won't go down uh, that road. <laughs> <laughs> so on Ethereum, if you want to create a token, you... Uh, you're going to deploy an ERC-20 contract. Typically, you're basically copying, pasting someone else's code, the open Zeppelin contract. You modify your metadata, and then you publish that contract on chain. You now have a unique address that's your contract address. That unique address stores the individual state of all the tokens, all of the uh, owners of that particular token on that one contract address. And so that's how it works on Ethereum. On Solana, very different. Tokens are actually, for one, you don't have to deploy a smart contract to create tokens on Solana because, like I mentioned before, Solana is super composable. Effectively, consider tokens at the base layer of the chain. There's an idea of tokens at the base layer of the chain where you can do anything for any sort of digital asset, whether it's fungible, non-fungible, semi-fungible, whatever, real-world assets, all those sorts of things effectively can exist at the base layer of the Solana blockchain. And how those work is you actually only have to send a single transaction to create tokens. You don't have to deploy a contract. So you're paying a single transaction fee for one. So that's one difference. You don't have to pay for, I don't even know how much it costs. So I've, I've never done it, honestly, on Ethereum. Um, but you don't have to pay that deployment cost of a contract because that is mm -hmm. an exorbitant cost for most people. Um, yeah, at least on L1, it, it can yeah, be. And yeah, now definitely even on L1. With, with L2s, like... I just deployed a contract the other day and it was, it was still like 80 bucks on an L2. Yeah. On Solana, you don't have to deploy a contract. You send a single transaction and you basically, you're interacting with a super composable program that we lovingly call the token program. And you just send a transaction of, hey, token program, create me a token. And that's it. Single transaction, single transaction fee. So that's one way that it's different. The other way that it's different is because everything, all the data stored on chain on Solana is stored in accounts, the way that tokens get represented is also in accounts. So tokens have this uh, tokens on Solana have this really interesting um, ownership uh, kind of model where the tokens that you own in your wallet um, for every token except for the native token on the Solana blockchain, the Sol token. So like Wrap Sol would follow mm -hmm. this. We call them SPL tokens for Solana mm -hmm. Program Library. And so any token you can think of, it's an SPL token. Um, with the exception of base layer salt tokens. Um, and so like how this unique ownership pattern works is the token program, you, you mint tokens just like a national currency. So like we're both in the United States, you have the U.S. mint, your national currency is controlled by the federal government and it's the treasury department controls the U.S. mint. The mint is able to create dollars, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing works on Solana. Effectively consider it like you send that initial transaction to create tokens, you're creating a mint and you have the authority to uh, mint additional tokens to uh, create dollars, create currency effectively. And all of that state is stored on the Solana blockchain in, a, in special accounts. And the way that ownership of those tokens, so like if you, owned X, you own X amount of um, this token, I own Y amount of this token, the way that that, re that ownership gets represented is called an associated token account. Effectively, mm. think of it like an address that is unique to your, uh, sorry, an on-chain account that's unique to the token mint itself, so USDC, and your specific wallet address. So if you think of it like, like a unique primary key in a database record, mm. it's like the combination of the address of the USDC mint and your specific wallet address, you sandwich both of those together, and this now effectively becomes your primary key in the database, effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually that account which stores the, the data within the account, because everything's an account on Solana, on chain. The data stored within the account actually represents how many tokens and like tracks how many tokens you have in your, in your balance. Um, and so that's the second way that is different. And yeah. it's, it's, this this usually goes better with diagrams. I'll be honest. Um, no, you're. I'm I'm tracking along. Let me stop and add like a few clarification questions. Please. So, the I mean, first of all, you had mentioned that we can create a token without actually having to deploy a smart contract. 
Yeah. And so that, that alone is interesting and in that I can just, I call an existing contract essentially or an existing program on Solana and yep. say, I want to create this token. And that essentially creates a mint hash, I suppose, like a, an ID or an account address. Yeah, effectively it's in it's account. now yeah. my an SPL token. And so then I guess that, let's see. So the difference here is simply that like I can, you said it's composable. So I can just call this token account, create my token, and I don't need to deploy a smart contract, basically duplicating that bytecode every time I want to create an yep, ERC-20. Exactly. So then in that sense, every SPL token, at least following this model, functions identically. Yep, exactly. And when I'm creating my token, like, so does every SPL token have the same number of decimals, for example, or is no. it... So, I, so when I'm creating it, I can like set some uh, exactly. Adjust. Okay. So the the token program has a bunch of uh, knobs and switches that you can effectively yeah. adjust. So you can get different customizations. I think off the top of my head, there's four or five. You can set how many decimals you want. You can set your um, metadata URI. So like wherever, like your image, your name, your symbol. Um, mm -hmm. Some of that stored directly on chain. Some of that typically there's a URI field that points to off chain data typical blockchain mm -hmm. action um and then decimals is another one and then one of the interesting things about solana tokens is there's also um there's two different authority fields one there's a uh, mint authority so you can set the mint authority to any address that you want so you can say maybe you want another program and this is a superpower of solana you can have another program be your mint authority and you could have custom logic within that other program that handles the authorization to create new tokens to mint new tokens mm -hmm. um and then or you can have it be a, a multi-sig or something like that. I mean, like typically multi-sigs on Solana are actually just a program. Because uh, yeah, like, sure. I, like I mentioned before, almost everything on Solana, almost every layer two solution for Ethereum, those are pretty much just a smart contract on Solana, a program on Solana. Um, mm. And so you have this, this mint authority, and then you also have a freeze authority. So you can actually freeze tokens, which is how you get soul bound tokens. So like um, non-transferable tokens. That's, that's one of the ways that you can actually have a soul bound token in someone's wallet, um, which can give you some real interesting use cases too for like real world assets and, and things like that. Awesome. I think you've already sufficiently convinced me that uh, Solana is <laughs> worth a second look. Yeah. Um, so you're, you know, you're great at the role that you play to do this type of work. Oh, well, so with that, before we transition to talking about like kind of more DevRel focused stuff, let's talk about the Solana dev list since we're kind of still in this, sure. uh, you know, developer focused section. So tell me how it started and, um, you know, what's been exciting about it for you and kind of what, what's next. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess how it started, it started as this idea, It, much like many things in crypto, <laughs> it started as um, some conversations on Twitter. And uh, a couple of people were, were thinking of, uh, about this idea of having some sort of list of developers that way. If you if you take it at the base idea of, you know, imagine you had an email list of email addresses that you knew were super high quality emails, they interact with your products or like developer focused products. And, um, you know, for like beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is a real person and mm -hmm. they're a real developer. <clears throat> Imagine if you had an email list that is that like, that's a pretty powerful email list. Like if you ask anyone who's in marketing and you <laughs> made those guarantees to them, they would be over the moon joyed. Sure. So that's the idea of the dev list. We wanted a list of developers that anyone can interact with and anyone can provide value to whether it's uh airdrops sure airdrops are cool but like discounts on services like rpc services in blockchain that's a real cost that developers have mm -hmm. uh things like tooling maybe a dev is trying to get access to some specific tool like crossmit for example you know services can offer discounts that are targeted for developers which are a great for the developer great for the person because they get a discount on a service but it's also great for on the flip side for businesses because you get a really high quality list of people that are very likely to a uh be uh very uh what's the word very um applicable for your mm. your product's audience um and that's very appealing for a lot of people so like that was the base idea and then i wanted to take it a step further because a lot of people have 
done this sort of idea of like, let's create a, a Google form, collect wallet addresses, and mm-hmm. we'll do an airdrop. We'll do discounts on services, coupon codes, you know, whatever. And that's, people have tried to do it before, but that gets siloed, that becomes siloed information and it makes it so it's not publicly accessible for anyone else to interact with. So Mm. that's where the dev list comes in. You can see in the background, there's a sticker on my shelf and I've got actually one on my, uh, here on my, uh, on my, on my desk here. But the idea is a publicly accessible list of Solana wallet addresses that are, uh, very high quality are very likely to be a developer. Civil resistance is a whole separate conversation. Like (laughs) it's a really hard problem. Um, But, and so like the way that we actually handle it is every single membership token. So we we call them membership tokens. So it's Mm -hmm. a uh, free to mint membership token. We don't charge anything. The the minter, the claimer of the token uh, of the uh, membership, like joining the list Mm -hmm. is they pay the transaction fee. But other than that, we don't we don't charge anything, and that's just base base fee on the chain. And it's a uh, we do we use tokens uh, specifically the new token program token extensions to create soul bound tokens, uh, non transferable tokens mm-hmm. that the owner can actually burn the token for one. So if you want to opt out of the list, you can actually uh, remove this soulbound token from your wallet, which is usually not the case for most blockchains that, do soul- that have the ability to do soulbound tokens that users typically stuck with it. It's not true on Solana um, with token extensions. So if a user wants to remove the token and like opt out of the list, they can mm-hmm. do so, which is awesome. I love optionality for people. Totally. And then the other interesting thing is um, we're actually storing some uh, custom on-chain metadata using the token extension program as well. So we actually allow the user to, the, the person to opt in to store their Twitter account and their GitHub account, their username on-chain. Oh. And that's interesting because one, it's on-chain. So you can see a wallet address and you can see a, a Twitter and or a GitHub, depending on if they opted into that. It's off by default, but if they want to opt in, they can. Mm-hmm. And this is interesting because... If you look at the list as a high quality marketing thing, if someone has a Twitter account and someone has a GitHub account attached to their dev list membership token, you know for a fact that it's actually theirs because what how to apply for the dev list is we intentionally added friction points for people in order to apply you have to connect a Twitter account and you have to connect a GitHub account using Twitter OAuth and GitHub OAuth. So that mm-hmm. way we know for a fact that you do in fact own that Twitter account. You do in fact own that GitHub account. And then we do a bunch of checks. Um, largely, we have like an automated script to try to ease the pain a little bit for, for myself and the other people working on it. Um, but we basically check GitHub. We scrape GitHub. We check the GitHub API and try to figure out if you're a real developer. And if you pass all of these friction points, you're able to mint the free token, the free membership token, and join the dev list. And then the the world is your oyster. And we're, we're encouraging <laughs> some assorted uh, people and companies to interact with the list in various ways. There's a couple that have already done so. Um, and it's, yeah, it's been really fun. Cool, man. Yeah, it's a fun idea. Um, I hope to see it progress even further and, and hopefully get got, adopted. Got some stuff cooking. All right, man. Glad to hear it. Okay, awesome. So now that you've uh, convinced the listeners to start devving on Solana if they haven't been already. Let's talk about how you reach these developers, you know, in your role as DevRel at the Solana Foundation and just kind of dig into what you found that works, what you found that maybe just straight up does not seem to work in terms of getting developers to engage with what you're building. So I'll just turn it over to you like that. What is... What would you say is like one initiative that you've had the opportunity to work on that seemed really powerful? Hmm. Um, I think probably the biggest initiative that I've, so I've worked on a couple of um, initiatives since been been joining Solana Foundation full time. I actually just crossed one year a couple of days ago, which is super awesome. And a couple of initiatives that we have that the whole goal is to have better developer experience, especially on the education and the content side. So, I did this this um, this idea of basically we're trying to like pump out a bunch of content as like the DevRel team at Solana Foundation guides, mm-hmm. written guides, video tutorials, that sort of thing, and uh, improving the documentation and you know all, all sorts of these content exercises, I suppose. And me specifically, I helped migrate the 
uh, original Solana documentation from one one site to another because we, mm. we did this weird split. And with this, it actually sets the groundwork for a bunch of really interesting things that I have planned in the future. Um, but the big thing is like we have now on Solana.com, we have uh, a bunch of written guides on how to do various things. And these can be simple things like getting started, how to just you're new to blockchain, you're a web two developer, like what is blockchain? What does that look like from the mm -hmm. developer experience? What does it look like to build a front end? What does it look like to build an on chain program? That sort of content. Um, and then we have a bunch of other things like how to run a node on some provider, how to, uh, you know, it, it, almost anything you can think of. Um, we're trying to create more content like that. And I think largely that sort of stuff does work. And the biggest thing to keep in mind for, for anyone who does DevRel anywhere is SEO. SEO is hands down king. It's mm. if you're doing DevRel work, especially if you're writing, if you're creating written content and mm -hmm. definitely true on YouTube content as well, take some time to understand SEO and how to do good SEO practices. And uh, find, there's like just some uh, automated tools out there that you can like check websites of their like approximate SEO ranking. Mm -hmm. Check out some of those on like whatever your documentation website is and figure out what terms are uh, your website is ranking for. So like Solana.com ranks for a bunch of stuff. Crossmint.com ranks for a bunch of different stuff. There's some overlap, but not much. Um, Ethereum.org has a bunch of stuff that they rank for. And then like you can compare your SEO standing against your competitors. So like ethereum.org and Solana.com, those are SEO competitors because we're all trying to rank for things like blockchain programming, blockchain smart contract mm -hmm. programming, that sort of stuff. Checking to see that type of information is probably one of the highest leverage things that you can do as a DevRel person in blockchain because it's like having... Like, like you said earlier, uh, Danny, is most of the developers that exist in the world have never touched blockchain. That's effectively what you said. There's a very small number of blockchain developers compared to non-blockchain developers. So especially my team at Solana Foundation, we have, much, we have a much higher focus on trying to bring in new developers than trying to uh, convince existing developers, existing mm. blockchain developers to use Solana. I personally think that's like hands down the way that it should be um, because like trying to convince someone who is set in their ways as a developer, like we're developers, we're stubborn people. Let's be sure. honest. Like <laughs> every developer has a tech stack that they like. And then they're opinionated about that tech stack, changing a developer's tech stack. If you haven't convinced them relatively easily, or if they're not interested, that's a really hard sell. Yeah. But if you're trying to convince someone to start using blockchain, that's an mm -hmm. easier conversation to have. So that's largely what we actually focus on, on my team. And it's just trying to grow the whole, the overall pie of blockchain developers, because like I kept telling people at ETH Denver, it's blockchain against the world. Like choosing a blockchain is like choosing a tech stack. There's pros and cons to each. Some have yeah. more pros, some have more cons. And <laughs> It's it's blockchain against the world. We have to convince more people to use blockchain, period, or else this industry is going to struggle. So that's that's where it is. Gotcha. That's good to hear. I have a follow up question there. Uh, so maybe you see this, too, but it seems to me like, I mean, before we know it, probably within less than five years, I don't it. Maybe we'll still go to Google to like try to find information, but we're going to be using natural language questions where an LLM is providing the answer. And so how do you think this particular thing that you said is, you know, extremely high leverage, good SEO, mm -hmm. will, will we need to adapt to deal with that so that, because I mean, even now I, I only use Google and other search engines when ChatGPT fails to get me the answer. I think more and more people are going to be using uh, large language models like ChatGPT and, and Google Bard and, you know, name all the mm -hmm. other ones. I think it's going to, going to become more and more common. But the thing to consider is, so if you take Solana specifically and ChatGPT, if you're using ChatGPT uh, 3 right now, the you can just straight up ask it, like, what's the last date that you index data on? Mm -hmm. And effectively when that data was indexed, when that when the language model was built was like when Solana basically didn't exist. So <laughs> it has almost no information about how to do anything on Solana. 
So, and that's the thing with blockchain is because blockchain moves so quickly, the tech changes and even like how you, how you handle different things on, especially on chain side, how you handle those different things changes over time, security bugs get found and that sort of thing. So Mm -hmm. I think the AI conversation, I think it's really helpful to do, uh, to get educated on like concepts as far as blockchain goes, get educated on high level concepts. But as far as like writing code, it does a terrible job for Solana Mm -hmm. because it doesn't know Solana. Um, there's eventually that will get better, but as DevRel people, I think that should be actually a goal because if you think of the future, I think it's very, very likely that more and more people are going to be using it. You know, uh, GitHub has their own uh, AI solution, Copilot helps you get code. And because they've checked open source repos and tried to understand what is happening, mm-hmm. the only way that these models get better is if there's more publicly available information. So yeah. if you take it from the perspective of, if you want your particular product or your particular blockchain to grow and to be accepted by these large language models, you need to create the content so that way they can then index it and crawl it and do their machine learning on that content. So the better quality content you write now, the more diverse content and the more comments and code, that sort of thing. Those are the things that we as DevRel have absolutely have control over. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a long road until until large language models start to, to pick up on that information, um, especially the scale of, of ChatGPT and, and OpenAI and all of, all of the big players. Um, that's definitely something that like we as DevRel, like we have to contribute to in order for them to have good information because like it or not, people are going to fall back to using it, especially the next couple of years, more and more people are gonna be using it. So if they don't get good information, that's a bad developer experience on mm-hmm. their part, which means they're going to bounce, they're going to leave, they're not going to try your product, they're going to hit friction points. Um, so it's, yeah, that's, it's a DevRel problem to solve it now for the future. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's perfect because it folds back into your previous answer that, you know, focus on SEO now, put out good t- content. Exactly. And those are probably going to be some of the tags that go into these models to, you know, be like, how do we rank the quality of this answer? Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. a lot of people, it was ranking well on Google, for example. Um, I'm curious, like if in the interim, you know, this would seem like a beautiful project for the Solana foundation to take on is to just build their own LLM that is fine tuned to all of the latest docs and content that you guys are putting out and just like, you know, embed it right into your own site so that people as devs are getting more comfortable with asking AI for assistance. You know, you guys have a a tool that's up to date, you know, because you can tune these models from what I understand to like when you update your docs, be like, Hey, Mm. this changed. (laughs) Um, Would that be something that um, you guys would consider taking on? Or is that probably a little bit more on a longer time horizon than we're normally dealing with in web (laughs) three? So it's something that we have uh, not thought about taking on. It's something we've thought about finding someone who does it. So especially at the Solana foundation, we, (laughs) the Solana foundation, has different ideas and ideology than most blockchain foundations. Okay. And one of those being is like, we don't want to own products. We don't want to own things. We, the goal of the Solana foundation is to help uh, push forward the Solana ecosystem, support them where we can. And this is the part that most people don't realize. And, and one of the ways that Solana foundation is different is we have a mantra of the Solana foundation wants to work itself out of a job. Every employee at the Solana Foundation, our goal is to work ourselves out of a job so that way the Solana Foundation doesn't need to exist. We want the ecosystem to get to a point where the Solana Foundation, this this liaison component that is the Solana Foundation, doesn't need to exist because the ecosystem perpetuates itself. There's companies that are doing things like DevRel that are doing a great job. Helios is a great example. They do great work for DevRel things. People building products like like a large language model there's uh, some assorted services that we are actually um, we've been talking with over the last several months and, and trying to figure out how it might make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so like it, as far as the Solana Foundation doing it ourselves, like it's never going to happen because we don't want to own products. Um, but if there was a someone in the ecosystem that was building something, then always happy to chat and uh, and help support it and hopefully even use a good one. Um, and the thing is like. I have personally tried a couple of them. 
Um, not, th- not necessarily ones that are Solana specific. I've yet to actually try a Solana specific one, but there's people that specialize, like they have products and services that specialize in, um, blockchain focused ones. Okay. And cause like the way that you have to like do blockchain things is just different than some other, um, tech stuff because like the security implications are, are far different, um, mm-hmm. far more drastic, I think. And uh, so in largely some of them work, some of them don't. So I think over the next year or two, they'll be better and better. And maybe they'll, they'll be at the point where the quality is high enough that we could use something like it on Solana.com. Um, but there's, there's inherently a risk when you have those sorts of things of, you know, especially on the security side, say someone mm-hmm. asks, say, you know, give me a smart contract. <laughs> chat GBT is a perfect example of this. Someone, multiple people were like using chat GBT to write Solidity smart contracts. And they were actually getting known bad code in their Solidity contracts <laughs> because these large language models heavily indexed on um, a bunch of articles and, and news, news posts and things. They were specifically talking about uh, some open source yeah, <laughs> vulnerabilities. They were like, hey, because th- they get a lot of traction. So they got a lot of backlinks, SEO. So the large language models were like, oh, this one has a bunch of SEO. People like it. So it would keep spitting out this bad, vulnerable code to people. And people kept deploying it because they don't, they don't have the understanding of how to do it themselves. They're just copying and pasting and deploying. So that's, that's one of the things that's like a very real concern for blockchain because the implications are, are so high when you have potentially a lot of money or really any amount of money on the line for yeah. programmable money on chain. It's a, it's a fine line that you have to walk for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to keep in mind as you're using these tools, especially as, as a seasoned developer, you kind of know when it's bullshitting you and you can Mm -hmm. just be like, that's not going to work. Like that's a bad idea. And you can, you can push back and say, no, 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 let's rethink this. Like, and here's why I don't like that. But if you're a really new developer, you might not have that experience to, to know that something's off. And so that is something we got to be careful with these tools. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's talk about the other real, real quick. The, the other yeah. thing to continue on that is, uh, so not even writing uh, blockchain based code. If you're writing like a guide or an article that also just explains things, if you're using AI to write those, it's mm. a vicious cycle. So you actually get worse and worse quality of content that comes out of the AI because then the AI will index on the AI written content. And in mm. fact, especially on the SEO side, like, I, I, I see a lot of articles that are very obviously written by AI mm-hmm. and read them. They're usually terrible. They usually don't make sense if you have any understanding of the tech and it, it falls apart really quickly. And it's super obvious. And on the SEO side, search engines and Google has explicitly put this out of like, they altered their algorithm. They updated their algorithm to intentionally try to check if an article was written by AI and it will actually demote that on the ranking scores because they're bad quality. So Mm -hmm. if you're, if you're doing DevRel and you're trying to use AI to write articles, be very, very weary because it will actually probably be a detriment to you. Yeah. I'm not a fan of this type of stuff either. And of, you know, have seen the results and there's just, it's something weird, you know, like you can read it and you just get this sense that something's off. Just, like a lot of times off. I'll, you know, sometimes Usually I'll tone. use these types of tools for like the blank page problem, as I call it, like, Hey, mm-hmm. you know, like give me an outline or something. And then I'll be like, okay, so what would that paragraph look like? And I'm like, okay, could you use maybe 10% of the adjectives and excitement that you've written? Like, cause it's just like, so excited all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, um, good points there. What about in your experience, have you come across anything where maybe you put a ton of work into a project or, you know, you've aware of others that have done this and then it just doesn't really seem to connect or resonate or at least get you the ROI that you had hoped for specifically in a DevRel capacity. Um, I think events are kind of one of those in-person mm-hmm. events, especially in the blockchain space. In-person events are are really hit or miss depending on the audience that you're going after. Mm-hmm. And it's like, because every event in blockchain is, is so different. Um, at Solana Foundation, we put on a bunch of events and our quality bar is really, really high. And I've gone to other events that were not explicitly put on by the Solana Foundation. 
and they're all super hit or miss. A lot of people do in-person events and like DevRel will go to them for insert chain name here to Mm -hmm. try to preach the gospel of use our chain sort of thing. And a lot of those events often, I personally find a lot of them are just not worth it for most cases because like to do a booth at an event like that's a lot of money usually Mm -hmm. and it's like you you pay a lot of money and you hopefully get some interactions but you're also competing with everyone else doing the exact same thing so it's like it's a really hard thing to do and it's it's also really really hard to quantify an roi from it Mm -hmm. um unless you have like an exorbitant scale uh I think that's probably one of the things that are, are that come to mind. That it's, just, it, it's just so hit or miss. You just never know. Um, yeah, that's probably the big one that comes to mind right yeah. now. Yeah, that's a good example. I would definitely concur that, you know, it, can, it takes a lot of money to get the team there. You got to yeah. fly there, get hotels or Airbnbs, you know, buy a bunch of restaurant food for five days or however long the event lasts. Um, yeah. yeah, and then you're competing with everybody else there, especially, you know, if you have a booth and then you're stuck there all day, um, trying to figure out if people just want your t-shirt or they give a shit about what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of times it, it, especially if you have like a booth, a lot of people will come up like, what do I have to do to get a t-shirt? We'll just straight up be what they want. Yeah. They, they're only there to get a t-shirt and it's like not a useful conversation. And yeah. then especially in the blockchain space, uh, a lot of people are go to these conferences of like pay to play of like they'll walk up and be very direct of how much money will you pay me to use your project, to use your protocol, to use your blockchain. And that's Mm. also very common. And those are largely not helpful conversations. They're not, they're typically not good for a blockchain's ecosystem. If you have these effectively mercenaries of developers Mm. and and (laughs) that are trying to do these things, it's like, it's generally not helpful. You don't, you don't get the the community building aspect that you, that you want and need in a self-sustaining ecosystem, like a, like a layer one blockchain. Mm -hmm. Um, but then you might get like that one or two good conversations of like a really good conversation. And like someone understands and that like something, they just had to have that in-person conversation to flip the switch yeah. of, of convincing them to, to take the next step. Um, so that happens, but it's statistically less likely. For sure. So you had mentioned, you know, especially with in-person events, it can be really hard to get a, a sense of the ROI. What are some ways that you've discovered actually help you measure this type of thing you know so and what are the ways that you look at that to know if maybe a piece of content is is really working or just in general what are some ways that you found to measure what you're doing in devrel i think a couple of things one if you're doing in-person events like collecting especially if you're doing like devrel focus ones collecting github accounts Mm. um because like most people uh people will typically publish uh, public repos. So then you can have like GitHub scrapers that kind of check stuff. That's how most um, developer focused analytics things like, like the Solana foundation, we have a scraper that runs to try to uh, get a good gauge of uh, developer activity. Same thing Mm -hmm. with um, electric capital, like the electric capital report comes out every January ish. They do basically the same thing. Hmm. Um, So that's one way. And (laughs) Get the GitHub API is not really super conducive to doing this information, collecting this information. <laughs> so it makes it really finicky. Um, that's probably one for in person. And then the other one is if you're creating content that is focused around some sort of idea. So like a, a topic of, um, I don't know, real world assets. So like, here's a, here's an article on how to build real world assets on the Solana blockchain, having code examples and things like that, where people can experience it and like, see what it looks like. And taking that to the next level of doing the GitHub scraping and trying to maybe at the bottom of the article, like here's a button, deploy this code to GitHub Mm -hmm. sort of thing and like experience it. Or in the Ethereum ecosystem, there's Remix, the web-based IDE. We have something similar in Solana, in the Solana ecosystem called uh, Solana Playground, where it's like a web-based IDE. People can interact and get that immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. Those things are really good. And then you can kind of measure on-chain activity on like DevNet and and like test nets to to see how those um interacted um but it's it's a really really hard problem to solve it's trying to get accurate analytics of doing like devrel roi 
notoriously difficult to track, which totally. is one of the reasons why DevRel is largely understood, uh, uh, misunderstood at, mm-hmm. uh, in, in the, the broader development ecosystem because it's so hard to quantify the actual impact other than mm-hmm. like a rising tides lifts all ships sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right. So, yeah, I concur with that. It is a tough problem to solve. And I, I think part of the challenge, at least for me personally, is it's not one that I'm incredibly interested in. I'd much rather just, you know, build a new demo or create Same. some new <laughs> piece of content than to like to try to actually measure it. So fortunately, we have other people um, on my team at CrossMint that are into that kind of stuff and they can <laughs> dig into those details. Yeah. So a question I always like to ask in this type of um, format, you know, the podcast is you come to the table with a ton of knowledge and experience, which you've clearly demonstrated. What is something that, you know, maybe I didn't ask you that you wish or think we should have brought up uh, that, you know, you'd like people to know about before we wrap it up? I think probably the misconceptions of how to get a job in blockchain. I think people there's two and there's two parts to that. One is salary. People Mm -hmm. sort of, seem to think like if you're taking a job in blockchain wherever in blockchain you're typically going to take a significant pay cut which is not necessarily the case Mm. um i've I've heard a lot of people tell me this like blockchain salaries like if you're working at it's like working at a startup you know you get a typical startup salary as especially if you're doing development work it's it's very comparable very on par um, and oftentimes it's actually even more because again, there's all those friction points of convincing someone that blockchain is the future. Mm-hmm. It's like one of the, one way to ease a friction point is with money. You can offer them to pay them a higher salary. That's definitely one way. And then, so that's one, the salaries are, are on par, if not better than typical web to, uh, definitely. tech industry. And then probably the other one is like how to find those jobs. It's there's tons of job boards that exist um, that do various varying qualities of job postings. Um, But especially DevRel specifically, one of the really cool things about DevRel is it's probably one of the easiest entry points to working in the blockchain industry as a developer. Mm. Uh, Unless you are trying to build something solo, like an indie dev, that's probably even easier because you don't have to, you don't have to worry about raising money. You're just doing like a side project and building something. But if you're trying to get a job and get hired somewhere, DevRel is probably the easiest entry point because you can inherently show that you can do the work, the job that is DevRel, that is a developer advocate without being paid for it. So you can write articles, you can create Mm -hmm. videos, you can uh, update documentation. So if there's like a product or an ecosystem that you're passionate about, like me, take Solana, you Crossmint, it's like if you go to the docs of, you know, if if the docs are public, Go to the docs, read through them, start opening PRs, solve the Mm -hmm. problems, make the developer experience better, make the education better. People that work in blockchain will see that. Absolutely. Especially in the Solana ecosystem. We see that all the time. And we help, especially at Foundation, we help get those people jobs. We help push them to companies that we know that need DevRel jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it's, it's, it's showing your ability to do it and the dedication in the ecosystem and doing it consistently over a, a period of time. Um, especially if you have really good writing skills or really good um, like product experience, if like build a full example product of here's how you would build a, a payments app, like a, like a cash app sort of thing. Here's how you would build it on blockchain, publish mm-hmm. that, write an article, make a video, share it around. Those things will get noticed by people that are looking to hire and that people know other people that are looking to hire. And we share that around a lot. Um, So those are probably the two biggest things that I would say. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, brought that up. Like one joke I always tell people, you know, if they learn that I work in Web3 or crypto there, you know, obviously they want to talk about like how to get rich. And I'm like, get a job, man. Like go work at a startup. You'll get paid well. It's crazy. Like I've never heard this idea that you could make a lot less money in blockchain. Um, it was part of what attracted me actually (laughs) is, um, that I saw salaries looked pretty, uh, interesting. Um, and I'm like, you know, you can get a great gig at an interesting startup. There's an equity component, and then you can really start to understand from the inside out what does make sense. And if investing is interesting to you, then you can do that with, uh, you know, a lot wider, (laughs) um, gamut of information and hopefully, 
perform well. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, exactly. Last thing I think really on this topic then is one thing that's interesting about Solana is there really is a lot of excitement. You can feel it with the developers and just the people that are into it are super hyped, like, and not in like a, a hyped, like a bad way. Like usually people in Solana are pretty passionate about it. What do you think drives that passion? Um, you know, I, maybe you can just speak from your own personal experience if you can't think of why the broader um, group does it. I think it's probably a couple of things. One, it's in the Solana ecosystem, especially at the Solana Foundation, we have this idea of we don't dunk on other blockchains. Like mm -hmm. if you if you look at the EVM landscape, which it, it largely people consider blockchain, it's like EVM, non-EVM. And then in the non-EVM camp, Solana is typically at the top. And then there's some other assorted um, blockchains. Mm -hmm. In the EVM camp, a lot of things that happen on social media, it's like anytime there's anything negative about one blockchain or a layer two or uh, a roll up or something, typically one other ecosystem will more or less, it seems like they're attacking. They're like, they're, they're throwing dirt on the wound. They're spitting on the wound of like someone's down because their blockchain has a problem. Like mm. it's, it's all very new tech that happens a lot. And in the Solana ecosystem, we actually make it a point, especially at Solana foundation to, to push this idea of a, we don't dunk on other blockchains. Like if another blockchain is, is having issues, like, we don't, we don't speak to it. It's just like, yep, that sucks. Wish you all the best. Good luck sort of stuff. Um, and we find that that works really well in our community as well, where it's like, it's, it's positive. It's like good vibes all around where people are passionate and like, we're not here to people that are participating in the Solana ecosystem. The majority of them are generally positive about the tech and the blockchain future. Mm -hmm. And the Solana ecosystem doesn't typically go around and smack talk other ecosystems. We largely have like kind of the ideas that I've, I've expressed here of like, it's a tech stack. It's fast and cheap. It's in the end, it's going to be someone else's, it's going to be your decision as a developer to build on it. If we have a, a better product, we know that people will eventually come to us. Um, and it's like, if you build it, they will come sort of mentality. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one aspect of it. And then the other aspect is, having people with with a voice like Anatoly, one of the co-founders, who is just like such an even keeled person, Vitalik as well, Vitalik Buterin, such an mm -hmm. even keeled person, seems like, like if you've ever interacted with any of these people, whether it's passively on social media, you just like see their interactions is like, they never say anything bad about anybody. They're just putting mm -hmm. out good vibes and they're just like here for the tech. Like this is very powerful tech and they see it as the future. And they're never saying anything negative. It's like perpetuating that idea of positivity all around and blockchain against the world of like trying to convince people to use the technology. I think it's those ideas that, um, that make it so that the Solana ecosystem feels so positive. And I'm kind of on top of that is like, it's also very welcoming. Like if you've ever tried to join an EVM ecosystem, it, they're very, uh, clicky almost where it's like, if you're not already here, you're not part of the tribe. Solana is not like that. Like I've, I've tried to join before I was like a member of the Solana ecosystem. I like dipped my toes in a couple of different, uh, EVM layer twos. And I kind of got the same response every single time of like, Oh, you're not already here. You're not die hard about our layer two go away. And like, it just wasn't like a positive experience. And then the, Sol the Solana ecosystem was the opposite of like, everyone's welcome. Come on in. We're building cool stuff. Artists, developers, content creators, marketers, whatever. Everyone's welcome. And it's like having this everyone is welcome mentality is, it's just so positive all the time. Um, even during the bear market, it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's been amazing. All right. Awesome, Nick. Well, thanks for taking your time today to, you know, first of all, walk through why devs want to you know, understand Solana better if they're not already in the ecosystem. This morning when I was kind of thinking through in, you know, a little more detail how to approach this, I was like, I'm just going to like ask the <laughs> questions I want to know about Solana and hopefully that'll yeah. resonate, you know? And then also I uh, appreciate your experience in talking about DevRel and you know what you guys are doing there. So excited to see it once again, um, Nick at the Solana foundation and check out his podcast with, uh, your guest is James, right? For the soul fate podcast. Yeah. Go, oh, this is James and check out the Solana dev list and hopefully you can get that token. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me, Danny. It's been great. Yeah, man. Talk to you later. Peace. Bye.